Hi all, Dave here. Thanks for giving me some of your time and tuning into my video. Especially if you usually join me for my regular stuff that covers skepticism and atheism, philosophy and that kind of thing. This is most definitely a bit of a different direction. It's something I've been wanting to and meaning to do for quite a while now though, as I love retro gaming. I always enjoy talking about it, probably as much as I do playing the actual retro games themselves. I think in some sense that's part of the retro experience, sharing some of the memories that we have about the computer, the console, the game, the time, that kind of thing. Nostalgia also helps play a part in the fondness for the retro scene itself, which is kind of what this introduction to me doing retro gaming stuff is about. Nostalgia. I'm old enough now where my nostalgia goes back a very long way. And there's been a lot of games on a lot of systems that I've played. I figured a video going through the various computers and consoles I've owned through the years, growing up mainly, and some of the memories I have about them, some of my favorite games and that kind of thing, would be a good place to start. I'll also discuss a few of the things I'll probably be aiming at doing for my retro gaming stuff. So I guess the best thing to do is to get on with it. Let's start with my very first system, the ZX81. Yeah, I'm that old. I'm that old that my first system was a ZX81. Yep, that tiny, mute, black and white bundle of complete awesome. I mean, sure, it had no sound. It was black and white. It had a terrible keyboard and only one kilobyte of RAM. But as a 10 year old kid, I thought it was pretty damn amazing. I didn't care about the keyboard because I'd never used any kind of keyboard at all before that. There was a little black box that would let me write programs and run those programs. There were no games with it, but there were a couple of books titled things like 50 games for the ZX81. So I knew that even if there were no games with it, there were some kind of games with it. And that's where my experience with coding started really, and my enjoyment of it. Which is a good thing really, because my parents didn't think to get a tape recorder with it. Meaning I couldn't actually save any of the programs that I wrote. It didn't particularly bother me, as they were usually pretty short programs. Doing it that way also helped me learn to program better too, and trying to recreate them each time made it kind of fun. It helped you learn how and why all of the lines of code worked, rather than just memorizing them. That's also one of the things that made it interesting as well. Trying to see if you could make it a little better, or mix some of the ideas up a little to make it an even better idea. Eventually, my parents bought a tape recorder as well as a Memotech 16K RAM expansion, which meant that I could try to figure out how to make the games bigger and better because it was the only way I was going to get to play any. I think the way I'm going to kind of judge these systems and the fondness of my memories for them is to ask whether I would want a mini version of them, similar to the SNES Mini or the Mega Drive Mini. So would I want a ZX81 Mini? No, not really, no. I know there would be people that would, it just doesn't have that kind of nostalgia attached to it for me. The kind of nostalgia I have for it, and the kind of fondness I have for it, means that just some small replica of it on the shelf would do. The computer that my family would go on to own next was the TRS MC10. Now, I know I didn't mention in the previous part that the ZX81 was a product of Sinclair Computing and that it came out in 1981, but most people into retro computing know what the ZX81 is, so there wasn't really any need. The TRS MC10 is a different kettle of fish altogether though. It's a pretty obscure bit of kit. It was released in 1983 by Radio Shack and it was kind of intended as a budget TRS-80. It was basically the ZX81 but a little bit better. It had 4K of RAM instead of 1K, and it had color and sound. The computer itself wasn't quite as powerful as the Spectrum, but it just sort of sat there existing in between the ZX81 and the Spectrum. Only it had no software, unlike the Spectrum. I feel like even the ZX81 had more officially released software. It was pretty easy to port ZX81 stuff over to it though, and just give it some color and sound. And I spent a lot of time doing things like that, as well as creating Etch-a-Sketch style programs to mess around with it so that I could take advantage of the colors. Would I want 
an MC-10 Mini? That's definitely no. I do have some fond memories of it, but it lacks the first computer nostalgia that the ZX81 had going for it. I can't actually see it holding a lot of fond memories for too many people either. I've met very few people that have ever even heard of it let alone own one. So it seems like nobody else would want one either. The next computer though, the next computer is the Commodore 64. So this one kind of changed everything when it came to how I saw home computers. Though not quite immediately, my parents did actually remember to pick up the tape drive with this one, and even a joystick. Still no actual games, but it was a big and popular computer that had a lot of games for it. So I just figured I'd be able to pick them up along the way. Which probably would have been the case if I was living in the UK, but we were living in Canada at that time. This meant that unlike in the UK where tapes were dominant for the Commodore 64, discs were the dominant media in Canada. Everyone I encountered that had a Commodore 64 also had a disc drive and not a tape drive. That meant that I had nobody that I could borrow games from, most of the games in the shops were disc only, and there were other things that meant that cassette based games weren't easy to get hold of and were also stupidly priced. The complete opposite of how things were going in the UK. So for a while at least, the Commodore 64 was still the same as the ZX81 and the MC10 to me. If I wanted to play games on it, I had to write them. Don't get me wrong, I loved programming at the time, so I really enjoyed getting to know the Commodore 64, and the graphics and sound were unlike anything I had access to before. But it wasn't for a few months, when my parents got a 1541, that how I saw the computer really changed. I got some blank discs and managed to get hold of some games from friends that I had. It's been a little too long to remember all of them, but I can remember Beachhead, Summer Games, Zork, Aztec Challenge, Minor 2049er, Pit Stop, and Gateway to Apshai. Mostly because I remember being kind of blown away by them. There was a good collection of arcade style games, and games with slightly more substance. Even the arcade style games had a little more substance to them than the arcade games that were clearly modeled on. The more games I got for it, the more I realized what an amazing system it was. The arcade conversions were usually pretty good, though as with anything else, there were also stinkers and absolute blinders as well. But my Commodore 64 journey was cut short here, or at least kind of. It's closer to say that it was split into two. My family moved back to Wales in 1985. The differing TV and power systems meant that there wasn't much point in bringing over the Commodore 64, so it got sold off. I did keep all the discs though, thinking they might come in handy back in Wales, but that's not quite the way it happened. First we ended up with a different computer when we got back to Wales. We ended up with the Commodore 16. Yeah, so when we arrived in Wales we moved in with my nana. There were a few of my uncles living in the house at the same time as well. One of my uncles owned a Commodore 16, and that was basically the computer that we had in the house then. It was definitely a step down and a step back compared to the Commodore 64. Gone were all the great graphics and sound, and all the great games. My uncle didn't actually own any games for it, and basically just used it to do coding, which is basically what I was reduced to again, writing my own games. Though you could actually buy games on cassette. The local computer shop had quite a few on the shelves. Most of the output on the Commodore 16 was pretty terrible though. The arcade conversions were usually complete train wrecks and barely resembled the arcade games they were supposed to be. Though there were the odd infrequent gems too. The one place that the Commodore 16 did kind of shine was the text adventure game genre. I actually bought a few of them myself. Sure, they were never going to be as good as something like Zork or any of the other Commodore 64 Infocom games. They loaded from tape, and that meant loading everything in one go, and fitting everything into 16 kilobytes of RAM. But given the limits, the games were pretty decent. Those I owned, I enjoyed playing a lot. The Commodore 16 was also the computer that inspired me to start writing my own text adventure games. Eventually though, we moved out of my Nana's place and into a council house in the next village, and the Commodore 16 came with us. And that ended up being my computer for a little while. Would I want a Commodore 
Commodore 16 Mini? No. Definitely not. There were no real standout games, and nothing that could inspire a collection on a mini console anyway. And the games that it was good at, the text adventure games, wouldn't really translate very well to a mini-style console. But there was also a parallel journey going on at the same time too. That journey being my Commodore 64 Part 2 journey. The part two of my Commodore 64 journey ran alongside the rest of my Commodore 16 journey. It was the usual story of having a friend with a Commodore 64 and a bunch of us all hanging out most days or evenings playing games on that Commodore 64. He also had a really good collection of games too. My collection of discs didn't really help to contribute as he had a cassette deck and not a Commodore 1541 drive, but he got new games every couple of weeks. Usually they were older ones that were either on sale or on budget or compilation packs, but it still meant that we got to play all the big releases, just not immediately. Plus, sometimes we contribute to his game collection as well. It seemed only fair. It was during this period that I got to play all the fantastic Imagine and US Gold Arcade conversions, stuff from Melbourne House. I also got to play a lot of really bad ones too, and just the nature of retro gaming really, as well as lots of those arcade plus style remakes that the Commodore 64 was just so great at. Games like Elite, Exploding Fist, International Karate, Commando, Way of the Tiger, and so much more. Plus all the great memories of hanging out with friends, having a laugh, and playing video games. Would I want a Commodore 64 Mini? You're damn right I would. There's a lot of fond memories for me with the Commodore 64, and a lot of really great games. There are also lots of those same memories for lots and lots of people. Which which is why there is an actual Commodore 64 Mini, which I also want. Maybe one day when I actually have some spare money I'll pick one up, but for now I have to make do with emulation. The next step on my journey took a bit of a giant leap forward, as it was the Atari ST. So my dad ended up getting a job working from home for a local software company and with that job came an Atari ST. Unfortunately, as far as the games were concerned, the job came with a monochrome monitor as well. The Atari ST was still pretty new at the time, so there weren't many games coming out on it anyway. I remember picking up the pawn from Magnetic Scrolls for it as it ran on a monochrome setup. Eventually, though, we got a color monitor for it, and I ended up getting hold of a handful of discs full of games. I can't really remember what, though, apart from Gold Runner and Altair, and over time I bought a few more for it, too. If there was a game I thought deserved support, then I would buy it. Gauntlet 2, Guild of Thieves, Dungeon Master, and a few more like that are examples of me buying games. I still used it for programming, and I collected public domain discs, and also demos from the various demo crews. I saw it as a pretty good all-rounder, and it gave me my first proper intro into GUI-based OSs. Then I met someone that introduced me to the wealth of compact discs that existed for the Atari ST. And by compact discs here, I don't mean it in the sense of CDs. Instead, they were discs that contained multiple games on a single disc. The cracking group had not only cracked them, but packed them down in the same way that a zip file might do. Groups like Automation had managed to not only shrink the size of the games, but also compact all of the data files into one file as well. These would all be packed into a single executable file that automatically unpacked into memory and then ran. It was pretty damn impressive to see at the time. The compact disks were basically a floppy disk full of these files with an average of four to six games on each one, and they usually came with a front end menu written by the cracking group that released it other examples are like the Medway Boys. They also did other impressive stuff like compacting two disc and even sometimes four disc games down onto a single disc. Or games that were notorious for interrupting the flow of the game with long load times were turned into what were called one meg versions where all the necessary files were loaded from memory rather than the floppy. The front end menus were always really impressive as well 
being sort of mini demos that showed off the coding skills of the Cracker groups. Would I like an Atari ST Mini? I mean, sure, it has some great games, and it has some outstanding arcade conversions. I also really like the battle tank style of the mouse that it had. It also had a reasonable following at the time, though the Amiga obviously slaughtered it when it came to popularity and technical abilities and whatnot. I think I'd also like to see one on my shelf. Not just a replica or a model, but an actual mini. So yeah, and I think others would have similar kinds of memories of the Atari ST. Plus it played a huge part in the 16-bit home computer war, which makes it worthy of some kind of remembrance. The NES also made a brief appearance in my journey as well. I was out Christmas shopping and saw one on sale in, I think it might have been Dixon's. It was the Turtles pack, so it came with the original Turtles game. And at the same time, I think it was Fester's Quest and Life Force that I also bought. It was a huge thing in the US, but it didn't really take off over here. So when I saw one at a reasonable price, I thought I'll pick one up and give it a go. My games library didn't really expand too greatly either. I had like Bionic Commando and a handful of others. The The games I had for it I liked and when I got older and tried a lot of the library that I hadn't seen I came to see what a great little machine it was. There's definitely some real gems along that library. Would I like a NES Mini? Hell yeah, of course I would. Not only was it a great little console at the time but it has a blinding range of games for it which is probably why Nintendo made the smart move of releasing a NES Mini and that turned out to be a great move as it was a great seller. Even today the NES Mini commands some pretty daft prices from some people. And its popularity and inaccessibility is probably why there are also so many bootleg versions of it on sale at stupidly low prices. The next thing that I bought was a Sega Mega Drive. And there was a few reasons that it drew my attention. First, it's Sega. I mean, who doesn't love the Sega arcade games? The Mega Drive also had features that were way beyond the Atari ST and the NES that I had. I also saw the version of Golden Axe on the Atari ST and compared it to the Mega Drive version, and I was pretty much immediately sold on it. Plus, the list of games I saw both out and that were coming out looked pretty amazing. Way better than anything the ST would or could be putting out. When I picked mine up, it wasn't due out in the UK for a while. But the backs of magazines had adverts for importers. I managed to find one that was a pretty good price and output in PAL. It also accepted both Western style and Asian style cartridges. I remember it being something like 170 quid with two games of my choice. The two games I chose were Golden Axe and the port of the Toa Plan shooter Hellfire. When I got it a couple of days later, I fell in love with it immediately. Golden Axe was one of my favorite arcade games and the Mega Drive had captured it perfectly. Sure, the downgrade in the graphics and the sound etc, but the gameplay was solid. And Hellfire was a pretty decent shoot 'em up. The Mega Drive was also small and easy enough to pack into a backpack and take to a friend's house, unlike something like the Atari ST. And it was popular among my friends, unsurprisingly. From there, I bought various cartridges from importers and then began buying them from places like Dixon's and Comet when it was officially released. There were lots of great games too, like Strider, Revenge of Shinobi, Super Hang-On, though my use of it changed once I got my hands on the Double Pro Fighter. The Double Pro Fighter was a nice little add-on that allowed me to play backup games from Floppy, and so that allowed me to play so many more games, obviously, and did actually buy the ones that I really liked and were really popular amongst me and my friends. Would I want a Mega Drive Mini? Not only would I want one, I own one. It's the one mini console I actually did put out the money for, as well as a six button pad. It looks great and it has a bunch of great games on it. Sure, I can play them emulated on my PC too, but the aesthetics of it are great. And it does add a little something extra to be playing it on the mini. In between me actually buying all my Mega Drive games and me getting the Double Pro Fighter though, I bought a Commodore Amiga. There were several reasons behind me getting it, including the use of BBSs and using something called UA Dialer. I was also part of what was called the Amiga scene, 
and so I could get hold of lots of games. If you know what UA dialer for the Amiga was, you'll know what I mean. It was also the first computer that I owned that I didn't actually do any coding on. It was used for gaming and for browsing BBSs and that kind of thing. The games that didn't play well on the Amiga, I bought on the Mega Drive. It was a system that worked out pretty well for me. There were also lots of great games on the Amiga that didn't make it to the Mega Drive, and on some occasions the Amiga versions were the superior version. Something like Desert Strike played slightly better on the Amiga because of the sound capability. Another thing that was kind of fun was to go through the back catalog of games, comparing the Amiga version to the Atari ST version that I was used to, and surprisingly there were times where the ST did actually come out better. Arkanoid is a perfect example of a game that's great on the ST, and it's great on the Amiga as well, but the Atari ST one just takes it slightly. The Amiga also had the best home computer pinball games I've ever played. The pinball Dream series of games. So Pinball Dreams, Pinball Fantasies, Pinball Illusions. None of the ports ever quite captured the Amiga feel, and no games have quite captured the magic that they had since. For me at least. There's, there's been some that come very, very close and are great pinball games, but there was just something about Pinball Dreams. Would I want a Commodore Amiga Mini? Well, hell yeah. And there is one. I haven't got my hands on it yet, as I don't have that kind of spare money, but maybe one day in the future I'll get my hands on one. I also think it's a mini console that would appeal to lots of people of my generation. It was a hugely popular computer back in the day, and it was the clear winner of the ST Amiga War of the 16-bit generation. Okay, yep, I put my hands up. I was one of the people that bought the Sega 32X when it came out. There was no way I was going to be able to afford a Saturn when that came out, and the local Comet was doing a deal where I could get the 32X and three games for 99 quid. I already had the Mega Drive, so I thought, why not? I mean, sure, there are plenty of reasons why I shouldn't, but there were three very good reasons why I should, and they were Doom, Virtua Racing Deluxe, and Star Wars Arcade. It was the cost of three cartridges cartridges roughly anyway, and I got an add-on with it, so that seemed like a pretty good deal to me. I know the 32X gets a lot of grief, and a lot of it quite rightly so, but it did have some cracking games for it when other things were taken into consideration. Sure, the version of Doom that it had had a lot of cutbacks, but it was Doom on a home console, and for the cost, it was better than any other version of Doom that I could play. Virtua Racing Deluxe also plays great. Buying it like this was actually cheaper than buying the Mega Drive version alone. Plus, I got an upgrade in graphics and gameplay. And it's also the only console that Star Wars Arcade ever came out on, with it being a really good game to boot. The 32X just kind of fit me at that time, and I wasn't disappointed by it when I set it up and booted it up the various games. They were better than I was going to get on the Amiga and the Mega Drive alone, and cost the same as a few new Mega Drive alone cartridges. It was basically made for someone like me, or at least that particular deal was. Would I want a 32X Mini? Not as a standalone thing, but if they were to start throwing in 32X games in with some of the future Mega Drive Minis, that would work. It was also roughly around that time that I decided to flog off my Amiga. It had pretty much come to the end of its use as far as the BBS scene, and my access to UA dialer friendly places was cut off. So I decided to sell off the Amiga and purchase the Double Pro Fighter that I mentioned previously. The great thing about the Double Pro Fighter was that it worked on both the Mega Drive and the SNES, which meant that I now had access to a whole new library of games. I also wouldn't need an adapter for the SNES to play US and Japanese games, as the Double Pro Fighter would take care of that. Which is why, and when, I picked up my first SNES. It was given to me by a friend of mine. He wasn't using his old SNES, so figured it would be in good hands with me. He gave me Star Fox and King Arthur's Knights with it. Getting Star Fox was pretty handy, as SNES games with helper chips didn't translate well to backup units like the Double Pro Fighter for a reasons. You're kind of limited to games without things like the DSP and Super FX chips, except in some limited cases. 
the Double Pro Fighter also came with a CD full of SNES and Mega Drive games, which was filled with all the latest releases, as well as a bunch of old classics. I could also borrow games from people and rip them from Cartridge 2 Floppy, which was pretty damn handy. It was during this time that I got to play a lot of the great games that came out for both the Mega Drive and the SNES, and I've got a lot of great gaming memories from that time, and memories with friends during that point in my life as well. Would I want a SNES Mini? Well, yeah, of course. This is definitely another one where I want the mini console version. And also, thankfully, another one where the actual SNES Mini does exist, even if I don't own one yet. It's pretty obvious to anyone why one would exist. It was an enormously popular console. It and the Mega Drive were the real driving force between the 16-bit console wars, which was slightly different to the 16-bit computer wars. And finally, we come to the Nintendo 64. This was the last console I owned during this run of computer and console gaming. And what do I mean by that? Well, these are all the consoles and computers that I had from a young age to my adult years. It wasn't long after the N64 that I moved away again, and it was quite a while before I started buying consoles again. I had plenty of friends who owned the latest consoles, and I got to play on a lot of the great consoles and games. But I didn't actually own them myself until I moved back to Wales again several years later. So I'll discuss them separately as this video is just about the consoles I had growing up. I know the N64 wasn't the most popular console at the time, and Nintendo certainly did make some mistakes with it, especially if we're thinking of it in terms of marketability and sales, but it certainly did have a lot of great games for it. Like most people at the time, Super Mario 64 was the game that introduced me to the Nintendo 64. And at the time, what a mind blower it was. It had clear, sharp and fast 3D graphics, with a look that neither the PS1 nor the Saturn could achieve. I also loved the joypad that came with it, and I know everybody hated it, but it made Super Mario 64 just a complete joy to play. FPS games like GoldenEye also played perfectly on them. That Z trigger made all the difference for these kind of games. Games like Zelda Ocarina of Time were also incredible. It had great graphics, atmospheric sound, large gameplay areas, and it had huge boss characters. Like nothing that could be achieved on the other consoles at the time. It also had its own unique style of games that just couldn't be found on the other consoles. Though of course, the same could be said about the other consoles. Racing games were just better on the PS1, as were RPGs. Arcade-style 2D fighters and 2D arcade conversions just couldn't be beat on the Saturn. Would I want an N64 Mini? Yeah, of course I would. There would be a couple of conditions with that, though. The first is that the emulation would have to be perfect. And anyone that knows anything about emulating retro consoles knows that Nintendo 64 emulation still isn't quite perfect. There are just games that don't emulate well. The second condition is that it would have to have games like GoldenEye and Perfect Dark on it. And with the whole Rare situation, I'm not sure that's even possible these days, especially with licensing for something like GoldenEye. But if those conditions could be met, then hell yeah, hand over that Nintendo 64 Mini. As you can probably tell, there's a lot of consoles and computers missing from this list. The Spectrum, the Master System, the Dreamcast, the PS1, the Saturn, they're all missing. However, just because I didn't own them at the time, that didn't mean I wasn't playing them at the time. I usually had friends that owned the other consoles and computers, and I got to play a lot of the great games on those platforms because of it. And sometimes we'd swap consoles for a weekend, that kind of thing. I also did some catching up when I moved back to Wales in my 30s. I started collecting the consoles and games that I either didn't own growing up or the ones that I missed that came out after I moved away again like the Dreamcast, the PS2, the Xbox and so on. When I moved back to Wales a friend of mine gave me his Sega Saturn and it was the one we used to play on when we were younger and another friend also gave me a chipped PSX. I also purchased an Xbox 360 that way I could play some of the latest games as well, and buying a 360 was a lot cheaper than buying a PC that would have the equivalent game playing abilities. And it had some awesome exclusives. 
So during that period of gameplay and console owning and collecting, I looked at it from a different perspective than I looked at it during growing up. Which is why I generally tend to separate how I see those consoles. It's a different kind of experience, and one that affects how I see the games, and even buying those games. And this will affect how I discuss the various consoles and various titles in future videos. So yeah. That was basically my computer and console history condensed down into a really short video. It doesn't discuss the computers in great detail or anything like that, or say the great range of games on each one, but I'll save those for future videos. As well as discussions about some of my favorite games on those consoles and computers. I'm also thinking about talking about some of the things relevant to those individual consoles and computers, like discussing the BBS scene on the Amiga, or the compact disc scene of the Atari ST, along with other things like that too, of course. All this gives you some kind of idea of what I'll be discussing in the future when it comes to retro gaming, as well as the kind of consoles and computers I have the most experience with, and when and why I had those experiences of them. You can also see some of the kinds of experiences I had with them too. This is kind of what I'll be bringing to the table in these videos. Though I doubt I'll ever be able to compete with people like Kim Justice, Sharopolis, Console Wars, GameSack, Guru Larry, and other great content creators, but hopefully you'll still find some of it interesting. Thanks for tuning in. Catch you again soon. Bye.